Cool. Well, uh, thanks everyone for the opportunity to come chat tonight or whatever time of day it is for all of you listening tonight for me. Um, so I'm Corey Watson. For those of you who don't know me, I'm an assistant professor uh, in the biochemistry and molecular genetics department at the University of Louisville. And uh, my lab focuses on uh, the genomics of Ig and TCR loci. Um, and um, because the short kind of talk tonight, I'm gonna or the talk is sort of short tonight. I'm gonna kind of narrow our focus and talk about a tool that we've recently developed um, for comprehensive genotyping of the Ig loci. And just gonna throw in some uh, sort of preliminary population level pilot data at the end, just to kind of give you an idea of some applications that we're currently uh, undertaking. So my lab is is generally interested in understanding how genetic variation uh, within the Ig loci, specifically when we think about uh, haplotype diversity at the population level, how this contributes to uh, things like VDJ recombination and the formation of the antibody repertoire inter inter -individ individual variation um, and repertoire dynamics, um, particularly how this plays out um, in the immune response and in disease phenotypes. And of course, it's probably appreciated by many uh, who are listening in that um, there's still a lot that we don't know about haplotype diversity. And my lab focuses a lot on trying to build up genomic resources for these regions um, and multiple species um, and trying to develop genomic tools to make it easier um, and uh, uh, more extendable to genotype in these regions and begin to bring them into sort of the modern genomics era. So why is it not advancing? Oh, sorry about that. And so um, just a little background before we launch into the, our work. So the cataloging of genetic diversity in Ig loci has been going on now for several decades. And traditionally, um, the field is really focused on coding variation. I put a plot up here just as an example showing um, all the known alleles that are currently curated in IMGT for functional and open reading frame uh, variable segments in the heavy chain locus, just as an example, um, and to give you kind of an idea of the level of variation that we, that we observe in the population. And so you can sort of see for yourself that there's quite a, quite a bit of difference between genes and the locus um, in, in that some genes will have one allele, other genes will have you know, 10 or even more than that. Um, but one thing that's really become appreciated, uh, particularly in the last few years, is that um, we've come to understand that we probably uh, still have a lot to learn about the extent of uh, genetic variation um, in these genes um, in the, and in the loci, uh, Ig loci at large. Um, and in particular, um, we, we know that there are many populations left in, in the sort of greater human population that are understudied um, and deserve a lot more attention. And uh, of course, this is a big effort now for uh, the ARC in general, and there's a German working group that's very focused on this. Um, in addition to allelic variation, um, there has been some effort to also start cataloging variation outside of genes, although this has been much slower, mainly because of technical reasons. And I'll sort of walk through that a little bit uh, in the next couple slides. And so this is the, the, a cartoon version of the heavy chain locus in human, which sits at the end of chromosome 14. Um, and right now I'm showing you functional variable segments um, next to, excuse me, the functional variable segments in green, uh, diversity segments in blue, uh, J segments here in yellow, and then the constant region segments adjacent to those. And so this is what the locus looks like um, in its sort of simplest form. And what we've also grown to appreciate um, in the last several decades as well, is that the locus actually is quite more complex when you consider variation between individuals. And in fact, when you consider uh, all the genes in the locus, including the pseudogenes. <clears throat> so if we were to sort of paint the pseudogenes onto the locus, as well as known structural variants, we can see that in fact, the locus is quite complicated um, and, and it consists of a lot of uh, duplicated genes, 
uh, that are all phylogenetically related. Um, and the locust has this sort of repetitive structure to it. In fact, greater than 50% of the locust actually falls within what we refer to as a segmental duplication. And around 50% of the functional and open reading frame variable segments um, uh, actually occur in copy numbers. So some, some individual genomes will have no copies of a gene, some individuals will have two copies of a gene, so on and so forth. Um, and we see this outside the variable segments as well, including in the, in the D region and the constant region. Um, so sort of uh, consistent with what we've observed in thinking about variable coding diversity, <laughs> um, there hasn't been a ton of genomic work done in these loci uh, either. And in fact, the two, there's actually both, or excuse me, all three of the IG loci have only been sequenced two times. Uh, and curated, sort of fully curated in their entirety twice. Um, and what we've realized now is that neither of these two haplotype assemblies um, do a great job of representing diversity in the population, uh, which is depicted here based on you know, the structural variance I've shown. And so this has really um, kind of uh, pushed forward this need um, that to sort of better genomic resources. And that's why my lab spends a lot of time thinking about that. And I'll talk a little bit more about the tool that we're developing to try to uh, resolve some of these issues. So with respect to ARC needs, I think, um, you know, one of the sort of most obvious uh, motivations for improving germline databases is the reliance of a lot of ARC pipelines um, on these germline databases for doing initial read assignments to germline genes that sort of facilitates more uh, accurate analyses of downstream signatures in the repertoires. Um, but in addition to that, there's also um, impacts that sort of impact, excuse me, that sort of influence genomic research in these loci in general. Um, and in fact, we now have a fairly good appreciation that the lack of resources for the IG loci have had um, sort of broader influence on the way that we've thought about and, and are able to interpret things like disease association studies. Um, we haven't been able to carry out many functional studies in this locus to understand how genetic variation uh, influences things like VDJ recombination, for example. And of course, when you sort of add all these things up, this means that that has, has obviously impacted the way in which we can leverage genetic data uh, in these loci to think about how they might be used to better diagnostics and therapeutics. And so, uh, my lab has been thinking for quite a while now on how to make this situation better. Um, and we have for the last several years been working on developing a protocol and bioinformatics solution to this, um, which has just been published recently. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about, about that now. And so um, basically what we've tried to do is adopt a standard oligo-based capture approach similar to like what you might do for an exome sequencing experiment, except we um, obviously are targeting the Ig loci and we're trying to pull down larger fragments than you would normally so that we can leverage long read sequencing. And the reason that we wanna leverage long read sequencing of course is that uh, we know that this can uh, lead to better, more accurate assemblies and then uh, you know, better annotations and uh, genotyping call sets. <clears throat> and so, um, in a sort of very general way, the way this works is we have a bunch of probes piled across um, the IGH locus, and we've included uh, additional haplotypes that we generated in the lab that cover structure variants that are known to exist in the population. We use these probes basically to pull down all that sequence in any given sample of interest, and then we go on to make uh, packed bio libraries uh, that we can then uh, multiplex and sequence and get data back from multiple individuals. And we recently, uh, as I said, published a bioinformatics tool to sort of accompany this approach um, where we take these long reads and we're able to use the SNP data generated from them to partition uh, the, the reads into haplotypes, generate haplotype specific assemblies, and uh, then go on to do annotations of genes, alleles, structural variants, uh, SMB calls, et cetera. Um, and if anyone's interested, this is just a plug here. If there's anyone, anyone's interested, the tool's iGenotyper, you can find it on GitHub. Um, and 
uh, yeah, if there's any questions about it, feel free to reach out and um, let us know you're interested. We're, we're keen to have people use it. Um, so when we initially started developing it, we, we began by doing a lot of benchmarking. Um, I think we're finally leaving the benchmarking phase now, um, which is a good feeling. But when we started, we actually chose a sample that we had done comprehensive sequencing. And uh, actually, while I was a PhD student with Felix, uh, where we sequenced this haploid sample uh, using Sanger, um, and we had bat clones from the sample that we were able to assemble and then stitch back together to create a high quality reference for IGH. This reference is now the GRCH38 uh, human genome build reference. Um, and so this is a nice gold standard set that we could use. And luckily we had DNA left for the sample. Um, and so we were able to use it as our test case, our initial test case. And so we were quite pleased um, because even our initial runs of the sample, uh, which we've now tested on a couple of different PagBio platforms, um, we were able to generate assemblies that cover 98% of this, of this uh, ground truth assembly. Um, and the base pair concordance between these two assemblies was greater than 99%. And in fact, there's so few uh, discrepancies between these two assemblies, it's actually not clear whether the errors come from the packed bio assembly or the Sanger assembly. And of course, given the high concordance, we're able to get 100% recall on the gene and allele annotations. We've now pushed this into diploid samples, um, so we, we, for our initial test and what's published in the paper, we chose two samples from the Thousand Genomes Project, one European and one African sample. Um, so we chose these samples because we, we've done a lot of additional sequencing and large insert clones using both Sanger sequencing and assembly and PAC bio sequencing and assembly. Um, and these data sets uh, have parental data uh, for phasing um, and additional whole genome data sets for, for a comparison. And what you can see here is that using phase SNPs, we're able to actually create uh, two phase assemblies. And in diploid samples, you can sort of see the value of this. We are able to reconstruct both maternal and paternal uh, haplotypes, and you can resolve structural variants, uh, annotate genes, novel alleles, so on and so forth. So depicted here are um, a couple of novel structural variants that we identified um, in the complex uh, IGHV 3-30 region. And again, when we compare these data sets back to um, our, our uh, sort of gold standard uh, Fosman-based assemblies, we see really high assembly concordance again. So we're quite pleased with the way the data have really started turning out um, and we're excited to be applying it now. So just for a little context, um, you, you also with this, just like um, we're seeing applied a lot in air seek analysis, you can get these haplotype resolved uh, V gene sets. Um, and of, of course, uh, the, the data are, are speak for themselves. They're quite striking and they reveal the diversity that, that we all um, are, are beginning to see in our data um, with respect to allelic variation. And it's notable that in just these two samples, there are 16 alleles that were not in IMGT. Um, so again, back to my earlier point, um, there's obviously a lot of diversity to capture out in the human population still. Um, and so obviously one of the motivations of what we're doing is to try to uh, create a high throughput approach that we think outperforms or is better than what's historically been available. Um, and so we wanted to do some comparisons to short read approaches as well as GWAS array and imputation based uh, genotyping. And so um, again, we went back to our initial haploid sample for this test and we did this again because it could serve as a comparison uh, for, for, excuse me, it could serve as a ground truth for comparing these two approaches. And what we see, I suppose not surprisingly, is that the PAG-BIO um, iGenotyper approach does quite well, identifying primarily true positive with very few false positives, as I showed a couple slides ago. But when you, when you take an Illumina-based approach, we see that um, although some true positives are identified, the majority of the data set is, is consisting of false positive uh, calls and, and it actually misses true calls as well. And this is consistent when we also see, when we look in the thousand genome samples we've sequenced deeply. Um, again, iGenotype recalls a lot more SNPs that are available in the thousand genomes call sets. Um, and the thousand genomes call sets also have a high false positive rate. Um, and this seems to be consistent with most of the samples that we've done from the Thousand Genomes Project. 
which is a sort of unfortunate finding because the genomics community in particular is very reliant on these data sets for things like imputation and whatnot. Um, and when we look at the C, where are these SNPs that iGenotyper can accurately assay uh, in, in contrast to the thousand genomes call sets, uh, we see that most of them indeed fall in these regions that have been deemed inaccessible by the thousand genomes projects for short read data sets. And then adding on to that, we also have looked um, at samples from uh, samples that have had uh, commercial rays run on them and then imputation based genotyping call sets generated. And again, we see um, uh, a much higher performance, obviously, when we do direct genotyping using the capture and pack bio method. Um, I won't go through all these figures here, but the one on the bottom is maybe the most telling. So in this sample, we see that directly genotyped SNPs primarily reside here at the distal end of the locus, which are shown by these yellow dotted lines. All the red dots are, are genotypes where the PAC bio and the SNPs from the array and imputation agree. And you can see at these different imputation hard call thresholds that PAC bio, the PAC bio capture approach way outperforms. So even in places, even in the hard threshold, uh, even in the hard call threshold point one, where imputation resolves a lot of genotypes, an overwhelming majority of these genotypes are incorrect. So that would mean that the sample basically um, is not capturing most of the variation in the first three quarters of the locus. Um, and this is probably something that's, that's actually not uncommon in GWAS studies for this locus. So I'm gonna, kind of uh, breeze through sort of pilot some pilot samples we've been sequencing. These are actually a gamish of different projects kind of ongoing in the lab, but I wanted to throw it in there just to, just to give a snapshot of the types of things we're seeing. And so this is on, this plot is about a hundred samples or so from various projects and they're different ethnic backgrounds. Uh, you can see the majority are European descent, but um, there's a reasonable number of non-European ancestry as well. Um, so we've taken the sort of the 80 samples that we had the highest coverage for just to see what allele discovery looks like in the locus. And so of course, as expected in this many individuals, we see hundreds of, of alleles. Um, but one thing that's notable is about 20% of these alleles, 96 in total are not found in IMGT. So these are not, would be considered novel alleles. Um, and in fact, a significant fraction of these are fairly common in this cohort. So uh, if you take alleles that are seen in five or more individuals, the number is 38 novel alleles. Um, and so again, this is just another testament that there's a lot of diversity out there in the population. If you were to sort of average across those 80, there's at least one, one allele in all of them that's novel. Um, these are spread against uh, different genes and subfamilies and um, they of course occur, uh, many of them occur in, in genes that are involved in structural variants. We can also see um, the sort of broader patterns of SNP diversity um, just by looking at the differences between populations. So in general, we see a lot of SNPs um, in each sample. So it can range from anywhere between 1800 to over 4,000 SNPs just within the IGH, uh, V, D, and J regions alone. Um, and we can see there's variation between populations, at least in this cohort, uh, which admittedly is, is still quite small from a sample size perspective. But you can see on average, Africans look to have uh, a little bit greater SNP diversity than some of the other populations. But on the whole, we see that um, the density of SNPs found within IGH is quite high. And in fact, it's three to four fold higher than what we see in the rest of the genome um, in many of these samples. And um, it does seem to be roughly on par with what's in HLA. And so um, this is, this is a, actually a, a feature we've reported it already or published already, but um, it seems to be holding as we continue to sequence more and more samples. So it does seem at least IGH is probably a standout locus in the genome in terms of how diverse it is. Um, we can do things like obviously compare across populations. And what we see, of course, is that while there's a, a, a great number of SNPs that are shared across all these populations, there's also a reasonable fraction of these uh, variants that are private or unique to these uh, different ethnic backgrounds, at least within our cohort. And even those that do overlap, we see uh, still significant uh, differences for many of these uh, variants with respect to allele frequency. So, shown here are pairwise comparisons between the multiple ethnic groups. Um, and those 
those dots shown in red are SNPs that have greater than you know 20 percent allele frequency differences between these two populations that are being compared. And so with that, I think I'm reasonably under time, I hope. Um, I'll try to quickly summarize and, and hopefully there'll be minutes for questions if we have any. So I think it's already clear um, that, that, that it's a true statement that the IGLOs are extremely complex and highly polymorphic. Um, uh, we often say and have said for a long time that this, that, that complexity means that they need more attention and the lack of genomic resources to date has really uh, stunted our ability to investigate these regions thoroughly in disease and understand what the role of IgD genetic variation is in the immune response. Um, we're, of course, trying to remedy this problem by creating better tools and resources. Um, we, I didn't talk about this today, but we're hopefully in the next few months going to be uh, publishing a bunch of different reference sets uh, for these from all the genomic data we've been generating the last couple of years, um, as well as some whole genome-based data sets. Um, I just showed you a tool that, that we are pretty excited about, um, that we feel is going to open up the space to allow for more comprehensive genotyping in IGH. Um, and being able to apply this at population scale and in disease cohorts, we are hopeful, or, or, you know, is going to lead to an improved understanding of, uh, you know, for the first time of what diversity looks like and what that means for the immune response and, and uh, VDJ recombination and disease, et cetera. And so with that, I'll acknowledge a lot of people. Uh, Oscar and William have been the main drivers of a lot of this work at the bench and um, uh, computationally. Uh, Melissa Smith is a really close collaborator who's been amazing uh, helping set up the assay and get all the sequencing running. Um, and Ali Bashir has been super helpful in algorithm development. And then there's many people down here who have been big supporters of our work and uh, have helped gather samples and contribute intellectually. Um, and of course, the AIR community and funders. And with that, I'll be quiet and take any questions. Hopefully, I haven't gone over too long. <laughs>